I now call to order the Society's 2,428th meeting in the 149th year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the fall lecture series produced by PSW Science. Because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing these meetings to you via Zoom from locations all around the globe, rather than our usual home, the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. Tonight, we will hear about differences in recent measurements of the Hubble constant and the rate of expansion of the universe and what these differences might portend for our understanding of fundamental physics. Our speaker tonight is Wendy Freeman, professor of astronomy and astrophysics and senior member of the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics at the University of Chicago. I'm Larry Milstein, president and program director of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC. PSW Science is a 501c3 nonprofit education and science organization whose mission is to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, to further scientific understanding, and to encourage scientific inquiry. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel where it will join over 145 other recordings of PSW Science lectures. We invite you to take a look and explore these presentations. And if you like what the society is doing, we invite you to become a member through the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. Membership is a foundation of the society. And I urge everyone with an interest in science to become a member. Please join. The society is grateful for the sponsorship of the 2020-2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and by a generous donor who was asked to remain unnamed. And we are grateful also for the sponsorship of tonight's lecture by PSW member Bob Terry. We thank all our sponsors. Before we turn to tonight's lecture, it is the tradition of the society to welcome new members and to read the minutes of the previous meeting and the summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected to membership. E. William Cole Glazer, a theoretical physicist currently serving as Senior Scholar for Science Diplomacy at AAAS broadly interested in science, science policy, and science diplomacy, who learned of PSW through PSW member Dick Garwin. Richard Talbot, an electrical engineer and principal professional staff member at the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, broadly interested in science, particularly quantum physics and computing, cosmology, and genetic engineering, who learned of PSW, quote, by watching, close quote. And tonight's speaker, Wendy Friedman. We welcome them to membership. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2,427th meeting and the lecture by Prasad Sinisi. His lecture on the mathematics of electoral voting systems and social choice is available for everyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel 
the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and it can be accessed directly from the PSW website, www.pswscience.org. James, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On October 23rd, 2020, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2,427th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The recording secretary then read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Prasad Sanisi, Associate Professor of Mathematics at the Catholic University of America. His lecture was titled, The Mathematics of Voting Systems, Mathematical Perspectives on Theories and Practices of Social Choice. Sanisi began with an overview of the Electoral College, whose electors elect the President of the United States. The college is a weighted voting system, apportioning to each state one elector for each of the state's representatives in Congress. Although the District of Columbia has no voting representation in Congress, it is apportioned three electors in the Electoral College. The states in DC are permitted to apportion their electors how they choose. Every jurisdiction except Nebraska and Maine apportion all of their electors to whichever presidential candidate wins the most votes in a given presidential election. Because the population of each jurisdiction varies, Senesi sought to measure individual voter influence in the Electoral College voting system and, thus, individual voter influence in U.S. presidential elections. Senesi then used the Treaty of Rome, which established the European Economic Community, to illustrate the dynamics of weighted voting theory. He described the various country coalitions that could carry any given measure in the treaty process. The BANZAF number identifies the frequency with which a voter is critical in a given voting system. A voter is critical in a winning coalition if their defection costs the winning coalition its winning votes. Senesi identified the BANZAF power of the six Treaty of Rome countries, each assigned between one and four votes. He then walked through the math to demonstrate that BANZAF power is an expression of the probability that a voter has the deciding vote on an issue. The Electoral College is a more complex weighted voting system. The system's complexity makes it difficult to calculate the number of outcomes in which a state is critical, divided by the total number of possible outcomes. Senesi therefore approximated probabilities using the Monte Carlo simulation to determine that California, the state with the largest number of electors, had a 23.75% chance of being the deciding state in a presidential election. Senesi then addressed the power of individual voters in a U.S. presidential election. To determine a voter's probability of swinging an election, Senesi first calculated the probability the voter is critical in their state, and then the probability the voter's state is critical in the Electoral College. Applying Sterling's formula approximates these numbers and indicates that a California voter is approximately three times more likely to cast the critical vote in a presidential election than a South Dakota voter. Senesi commented that at, this, at the level of the individual voter, more populous states are more influential in the Electoral College than less populous states. He then summarized various arguments both in favor and against changing the system for electing U.S. presidents. While single vote ballots are predominant in the U.S., there are more nuanced voting systems that allow voters to express the order of their preference for multiple candidates. Under the plurality method, the candidate with the plurality of first place votes wins. The method developed by Jean-Charles de Borda awards points to candidates depending on whether they are ranked first, second, or third on individual ballots to elect the winner of the most points. Positional voting expands the Borda methodology to assign points to every candidate on a ballot. Instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting allows voters to rank their choice of candidates and eliminates candidates receiving the least number of votes until one candidate receives a majority of the votes. The Coombs method is similar to ranked choice voting, but eliminates candidates in order of the greatest number of last place votes they receive. Senesi then evaluated each of the five voting systems he described using various theorems to identify potentially unsatisfactory results and means of manipulation. Despite the respective faults, 
Each of the five methods is used in government and non-government elections around the world. In the US, ranked choice voting, or RCV, has become the most popular alternative to single vote ballots. In 1915, Ashtabula, Ohio became the first US jurisdiction to use RCV, using it to elect their city council. In the decades that followed, of the 24 cities that adopted RCV, 23 repealed it. In recent years, however, RCV has rebounded in popularity. RCV proponents argue that it limits the spoiler effect and incentivizes candidates to reach out to a broad spectrum of voters to reduce political polarization. This year, Maine will be, and now was, the first state to use RCV in a general presidential election. President Milstein then moderated questions from the online viewing audience. One member asked how various assumptions impacted the speaker's individual voter power calculations. Sinesi said more in-depth analysis of the number of eligible voters and voter turnout would impact his results. Another member asked the speaker about his recommendations for electoral college reform. Sinesi said existing inequities could be ameliorated by improving electoral college apportionment. He noted the U.S. is now on its fifth different apportionment method to assign congressional seats and, accordingly, electoral college votes. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.43 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting. The temperature in Washington, D.C., 20 degrees Celsius. The weather, clear. The number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 90, and views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 186. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor at corresponding sec at pswscience.org. We now turn to tonight's lecture. Is there a crisis in cosmology? And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Wendy Friedman, who is joining us from lovely Pasadena, California, home of the California Institute of Technology and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Wendy is a Sullivan Professor in Astronomy and Astrophysics and Senior Member of the Kavli Institute for, Cosmological Ast for Cosmology and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Previously, she was Greenwald Director at the Carnegie Observatories. Wendy's research is on measuring current and past expansion rates of the universe and characterizing the nature of dark energy. She was principal investigator on the long-term Hubble Key Project to measure the current expansion rate. And while Greenwald director at Carnegie, she initiated and was the founding chairperson for the 25 meter giant Magellan optical telescope that when it's built will be the largest optical telescope in the world. Among many other honors and awards, Wendy is the recipient of the Sagan Memorial Award the Cosmos Club McGovern Award, the Magellanic Prize of the American Philosophical Society, the Gruber Cosmology Prize, and the Heinemann Prize in Astrophysics. Wendy is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Physical Society. She earned her Bachelor of Science, her Master's of Science, and her PhD at the University of Toronto. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during the question and answer period. Wendy, the screen is yours. Well, it's a pleasure this evening to be speaking to you about a new debate that has risen and risen in the field of cosmology. And over the last century, and particularly over the last couple of decades, uh, a standard model, what cosmologists refer to as a standard model of cosmology, has emerged. And that is a model of an expanding universe 
a model that contains a component of dark matter, that is matter that does not emit electromagnetic radiation, a component that has six times the amount than the luminous matter that we all know and love, the baryonic matter component of the universe. And finally, a component that is dark energy and that is a repulsive, has a repulsive nature and is causing the universe not only to expand, but to accelerate. And this model, this standard model known as the Lambda CDM model, that is it has cold dark matter and it has the cosmological constant originally postulated by Albert Einstein has become our standard cosmological model. And, and it fits a remarkable wealth of data that describes uh, both length scales and time scales in the universe. And recently there have been some hints that that model may have some cracks in it. And one of the hints comes from our measurement of the current expansion rate of the universe. This is the quantity known as the Hubble constant. Now, when I began my career, I entered a debate at that time. We didn't know the value of the current expansion rate of the universe to better than a factor of two. And it wasn't until we had uh, the um, uh, accessibility to the Hubble Space Telescope allowed us to get above the Earth's atmosphere and to make measurements of a type of star called the Cepheid variable. We'll discuss those more in the course of the lecture. And this is one of the most accurate means that astronomers have for measuring distances in the local universe. And until we had the Hubble Space Telescope and could get above the Earth's atmosphere, there were a lot of systematic issues that we had to overcome to make very accurate measurements of this expansion rate, the, the current expansion rate. And our group did that as a group that I led in the 1990s. We published a final paper in 2001 and resolved this factor of two debate. We found a value for the Hubble constant of 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The range of values in the published literature at that time was between 50 and 100, but we put that issue to rest and, and it has st stood the test of time. But what has improved is the precision with which we can make these measurements. And now we can provide constraints on the standard cosmological model. And one of the hints that there may be something we don't understand in the standard model comes from comparing what we infer from measurements of the background radiation, that is fluctuations in the temperature of the background radiation when you apply our standard cosmological model and then infer what the current expansion rate of the universe would be based on these early observations of the, the uh, temperature fluctuations in the background radiation, assuming this model. And there turns out to be about a 9% difference in what is measured locally using these same Cepheid variables that um, both Edwin Hubble used and we use for the key project and which we use today uh, with more modern measurements. So 9% difference, uh, which is indicating if the uncertainties, if, if we have kept the systematic uncertainties in check, that there's some sort of missing figure, uh, some sort of missing physics in the standard model. So it's a very exciting time in the field because uh, we have an opportunity now to probe the physics of the early universe. And uh, if, if that uh, stands the test of time to learn about what that early universe physics might be that is missing from our standard model, or to confirm the standard model, which would be equally exciting that we would actually have at that point a rather complete standard model. And, and so I'm going to walk through uh, the various components of the standard model uh, and a little bit of a historical um, uh, uh, description of how we came to understand that the universe is expanding, how we came to determine that there is dark matter in the universe, and also the measurements of the acceleration of the universe that provide now this um, uh, evidence for uh, the standard cosmological model. And so let me begin with the expansion of the universe. And the cosmological model is, of course, rooted in uh, general relativity, Einstein's theory, general theory of relativity. And 1915, he came up with this theory of gravity uh, the energy momentum tensor on the right describes the energy and matter content in the universe, whereas the left-hand side of Einstein's equation describes the overall geometry or the curvature of the universe. 
And at the time that in 1915, Edwin Hubble hadn't yet made the discovery of the expansion of, of the universe. And so Einstein added into his, his equation a term that forced the universe to be static. And the, the reason he, of course, consulted with astronomers uh, at the time, there was absolutely no indication that the universe was either expanding or contracting. And so he forced it to be static. It was simply a mathematical convenience. There was no underlying physical motivation that would describe what this cosmological constant uh, uh, was. It was a mathematical term. <coughs> now, in, uh, in the early 1920s, and in fact, in 1920 itself, there was a debate that took place in Washington, D.C. in April of 1920. And the issue at that time was whether or not uh, the, the universe was described by the, the Milky Way galaxy. This I'm showing here is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a nearby neighbor to ours. Uh, and it was Hubble who ascertained that. And the question was, uh, were these nebulae that had been known for a couple of centuries were they regions of gas and dust within our own Milky Way galaxy that were collapsing to form new stars, or could they be so-called island universes unto themselves, that is similar to the Milky Way and uh, would lead to a much larger universe than, than the Milky Way alone? And that was not at all clear that the um, uh, ultimately was resolved with Edwin Hubble's measurement of what I mentioned, these Cepheid variables within galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy shown here. So these Cepheid variables are stars whose outer atmospheres are in motion, they're actually pulsating, and they have a relationship between the rate at which their atmospheres are pulsating and their luminosities. So if you can measure the apparent luminosity of the star, which Edwin Hubble did, and you can measure the period of the star, you calibrate this, say, within our own Milky Way galaxy using geometric techniques. For example, measure a direct geometric parallax to a nearby Cepheid. Then you can work your way out to larger and larger distances in the universe and uh, calibrate the Cepheid distance scale. So his first result was to first show that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way galaxy. They were galaxies in their own right, and they were at much greater distances than the confines of the Milky Way galaxy. But by 1929, he had made a number of these measurements and used other techniques uh, to allow him to move out beyond where he could actually discover the Cepheids. And he was able to show that the universe was expanding. And this is his uh, actual plot, it was published in the National Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. As I, and this is velocity as a function of the distance. And you can see there's a, a fair amount of scatter in the plot, but unambiguously, the farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster that it's uh, moving away from us. There are a few galaxies uh, nearby. In fact, Andromeda is one of those galaxies that has a velocity. It's actually a blue shift and it's uh, moving toward us. We will eventually collide. And there are a handful of galaxies in the nearby universe that have velocities that are um, approaching us. But by far, most of the galaxies in the universe are receding from us in a way that their velocities are proportional to their distances. Uh, very interesting, nobody caught this at the time, but this actually is the plot that went into his paper where the velocity is in kilometers rather than kilometers per second. I, uh, when I grade my students, would take off some uh, points here from <laughs> wrong units. Uh, nevertheless, this is the plot that led to the discovery of the expansion of the universe. If you take these data and uh, allow, within the context of general relativity, uh, a, a universe now where the galaxies are uh, expanding, then there would have been a time in the past when those galaxies would have been closer together and the density uh, and, the, and the temperature in the universe would have been much higher. And that's what led to our current picture of a, a Big Bang universe. So that was a discovery made in 1929. And unbeknownst to Hubble, there were many uh, errors in the, the distances that he measured. He obtained a value of the Hubble constant of 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. 
And that largely was a result of a few factors. One, he used photographic plates. Those were the only detectors available. It wasn't until we got linear detectors like charge coupled devices and near infrared arrays that allowed us to make more accurate measurements of the luminosities. But also he neglected the effects of uh, what we now know. In fact, he knew he didn't have a means of correcting for the presence of interstellar dust. So you can see these dark lanes in here in the Andromeda galaxy. These are the regions, uh, there are uh, new stars are being formed, there's gas and there are dust particles that are created in the atmospheres of previous generations of stars. The stars become supernovae or novae and uh, this uh, material is spewed out into the regions between stars, the interstellar medium, and it has the effect of obscuring the light that's coming to us from these distant Cepheids. It makes them both fainter and it makes them redder. Uh, the light is being both scattered and absorbed by the dust grains. And if you don't correct for it, you think your galaxy is farther away. It appears fainter, uh, but it's fainter because of the dust and Hubble was unable to make a correction of that nature. The other was that the Earth's atmosphere is turbulent and making measurements from ground-based telescopes uh, when you're looking for individual stars against the background light of an entire galaxy, it's, uh, you need high resolution to do that. And so uh, without the Hubble Space Telescope, we weren't able to make uh, measurements of the accuracy that we required until the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, named after, of course, Edwin Hubble. So we can uh, write uh, the Einstein's equation. Uh, this is the, the Friedman equation that describes the dynamics of, of the universe. And um, here is the Hubble constant or the Hubble parameter. It actually is a parameter. It does vary with time. But when we make our measurements locally, we measure the same value of the Hubble constant at a given time. And any observer will, will do that. Um, this was Alexander Friedman who uh, solved for a dynamic form of Einstein's equation. Einstein, recall, had put in this cosmological constant uh, represented here by this Greek letter uh, lambda to force the universe to be static. And um, when Edwin Hubble made the measurements of um, uh, distances to galaxies, his so-called Hubble law, Einstein is, is um, quoted as having said that uh, this was the biggest uh, mistake of his career. He had had the opportunity to predict the expansion. His equations were demanding it, but um, because there was no evidence for expansion, he simply um, added this fudge factor. So uh, this is the Hubble parameter on this side. Uh, this is the scale to the first derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor. So the Hubble constant squared and uh, the scale factor, of course, being the size of the universe relative uh, to the size now at a given redshift. Uh, this is the density parameter represented by the Greek letter rho. Here is his curvature term and a cosmological constant. Now today we understand the uh, cosmological constant as th there's a physical motivation having to do with the, the vacuum energy of, of space. Uh, space is not empty. There are virtual particles that are being formed, come in and out uh, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, very short lived, but they contribute an energy density to the vacuum. And so, in fact, Einstein may have been correct after all. Uh, there may be a cosmological constant, as we'll see the evidence from type 1a supernovae. Um, but the, the issue is, why is it uh, so small relative to what you would predict from uh, elementary particle physics? And that remains uh, a mystery. OK. So uh, the period luminosity relation for Cepheids, so this is the original plot shown by Henrietta Leavitt here. She was working at the Harvard College Observatory in the early 1900s. She's the person who discovered this relationship between how bright a Cepheid is and uh, what its period of variation. And uh, the, the more luminous a, a Cepheid, the shorter, uh, the, sorry, the more luminous it is, the longer the period of variation. This is the atmospheres of the stars are actually um, takes longer for a, a larger atmosphere to go through its pulsation uh, cycle. 
but again, if you can measure Cepheids in uh, distant galaxies, this is a, a galaxy here that was measured with the Hubble Space Telescope soon after it was launched, then you can measure the distances to nearby galaxies. And today, the most precise measurements come from measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope above the Earth's atmosphere. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, a mid-infrared sensitive telescope. Now, it turns out that interstellar dust grains, the uh, wavelength dependence of the extinction or the effect of the absorption and scattering by the, the dust particles is inversely proportional to wavelength. And so the more to the red part of the spectrum you can make your observations, the less sensitive you are to the effects of this interstellar dust, uh, which turned out to be a large systematic and one of the big reasons for the De debate at the level of a factor of two was that um, uh, one group was not correcting for the presence of interstellar dust. Okay, so we can now make very accurate measurements. Here's the luminosity as a function of the period for Cepheids in our nearby neighbor, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And uh, the points shown in, in yellow here are observations made of Cepheids in our own Milky Way galaxy. These were made with the Spitzer Space Telescope at 3.6 microns. You can see that the scatter in these points is uh, actually very small. And in the infrared for uh, a, a detection of an individual Cepheid, the scatter amounts to less than 5%. So for a sample of 100 or so Cepheids, the, uh, the scatter in, in distance is, is less than a, a percent. Uh, now, if statistical errors were all that we were, had to be concerned about, we could have distances that were better than a percent. But the issue of systematics is one that's always forefront in our minds. And that's where uh, we, we've had to spend a considerable amount of time devising new techniques to bring down the systematics and compare different methods, go as far as we can to the, the red part of the spectrum, get above the Earth's atmosphere, and increase the numbers of, of galaxies in our sample. Um, so uh, what we do is measure these Cepheid variables locally, or as I'll describe in a moment, one of the uh, projects that I've been involved in that I've led for the last 10 years is to develop a new technique using a type of star called the red giant branch star. But we measure uh, parallaxes for these stars nearby. Uh, we step out uh, to more distant galaxies where we can use Hubble and apply the, the uh, red giant or Cepheid distance techniques, and then we uh, uh, apply those to type 1a supernovae that we can observe over most of the volume of the universe. So we need to step out to the large distances because galaxies, of course, uh, interact with their neighbors gravitationally. They induce what we uh, refer to as peculiar motions, and that are uh, those are velocities above and, and, and below the expansion velocity that uh, Edwin Hubble, named after Edwin Hubble. So we, we, the Cepheids themselves don't allow us to go far enough out into the universe to overcome the peculiar velocities at the level that we need to go. Now, I mentioned we uh, got to a factor, uh, got over the factor of two uncertainty with the key project uh, with Hubble. We uh, determined uh, an uncertainty of 10%, and now we're at the few percent level. And we'd like to uh, prove that even farther if we're going to make claims about additional physics uh, uh, beyond the standard model. That's uh, imperative that we do so. And so, as I was just describing, we, we measure distances locally. Uh, the geometric parallax technique is uh, the most accurate means that we have. We just make use of the Earth's motion in its orbit about the sun and observe uh, a Cepheid or a red giant branch star at different points in the Earth's orbit. And we can literally, using high school geometry, measure the, the parallax of the star and uh, determine uh, the distance to very high accuracy. And I'll mention a satellite, a European satellite by the name of Gaia, which is at the moment, uh, and has been for several years, measuring a billion stars within our Milky Way galaxy, for which they will ultimately have parallax measurements that are better than 1%. So we are rapidly moving from an era where we were talking about uncertainties at a level of a factor of two in distances to now we're getting to the point where we're going to have sub-percent 
uh, percent uh, accuracy in our in our distances, which is unheard of. And I think many of us who started out many years ago never thought we would be able to use those words in the same same sentence. We also have an opportunity to uh, measure a geometric distance in a, a galaxy that's at seven megaparsecs. It's a, a galaxy that hosts um, black hole at its center, uh, supermassive black hole. And there are water megamasers that are orbiting the black hole. And it's possible, so these are uh, in an edge on uh, disc where you can measure the radio velocities and also proper motions and, and measure uh, a geometric measurement for that distance uh, to that galaxy. And so there are many ways now of, of determining the, the absolute calibration for Cepheids and for these red giant branch stars. So we can look for systematics in, in, in one method or another, uh, because we don't have to rely simply on the Cepheids, which which uh, is something that, that concerns me. I, I think we will never get to the bottom of understanding whether or not we have new physics if we don't uh, get the systematic errors to a level where we can be assured that they aren't dominating the, the difference. Uh, so, and then we use the Hubble Space Telescope. We measure nearby galaxies, uh, the Cepheids that I told you about. That's, that was the basis of the Hubble Key Project that we uh, completed about 20 years ago. And uh, what we use today, we use both Cepheids and we also use these red giant branch stars. And then we go to more distant galaxies. So we measure those in galaxies which also have had type 1a supernovae in them. And then we tie into the distant universe where there are now thousands of supernovae that uh, have been measured. But the supernovae give you relative distances only. And so the reason that I'm going through this uh, description of how we go from the nearby universe to the distant universe, we can't do this in one shot. The uh, type 1a supernovae are very rare. They happen about once per century in an individual galaxy. We need to survey many of them, thousands of them, to find uh, where these supernovae are going off. And if we're lucky, uh, one every two to three years will go off in a galaxy that is close enough that we have access with the Hubble Space Telescope to discover Cepheids or to measure the red giant branch stars out in the distant halos of those galaxies. And then those are tied via geometric parallaxes. And that's what allows us to measure the Hubble constant. So here I'm showing you the original plot of Hubble's that led to his discovery of the expansion and uh, the fact that uh, you could measure the uh, velocity versus distance. Um, his uh, original diagram fits in this first tick mark right here. And the plot that I'm showing you now is from our uh, Hubble Space Telescope key project. This was uh, uh, based on the distances to nearby galaxies using Cepheid variables for which we determined the value of the Hubble constant of 72 with an accuracy of 10%. And that value has stayed pretty stable in uh, intervening time. Uh, using Cepheid variables leads to a value of the Hubble constant roughly 70 or 74. Okay, now I want to turn to the issue of dark matter, and uh, which is another component of the um, standard cosmological model. And th uh, the evidence for dark matter, the first evidence really surfaced er early on in the 1930s, in fact. It was uh, Fritz Zwicky, the astronomer, uh, an astronomer at Caltech, who was observing galaxies in a, a cluster, the Coma Cluster, it's a relatively nearby cluster of galaxies. And what he noticed was that the motions of these galaxies when he measured their velocities were much greater than they would be if the amount of matter which you would calculate using the luminous matter that you could see uh, were all that there were. And uh, those galaxies would have flown away long ago. They would not have been gravitationally bound to the cluster if there weren't more matter there than he could see. And this was a problem that had remained for decades. People really didn't know what to do with it because it didn't seem to make any sense. And in the 1970s, people began to measure the velocities of stars in spiral galaxies. Um, and what was uh, the expectation 
was that the uh, velocity would fall off um, from the luminous matter in, in a manner that's similar to what we see in our own solar system, Keplerian motion. And uh, we know in our own solar system that as you go out uh, to the more distant planets, the velocity falls off with distance. And it's just, a, these are Kepler's laws, Newton's laws. We learned about this in, in high school physics. And uh, that was the expectation. To everyone's surprise, what, what turned out was that the rotation curves just kept rising. And so where you would expect them to fall, the velocities of the stars again exceeded what you would have if uh, these stars would not have remained bound to the outer regions of the galaxies. And it, it, these measurements were made for tens, if not hundreds of galaxies. The, the rotation curves kept rising or uh, eventually becoming flat. Again, indicating that there was more matter there than you could see that, that was indicated by the luminous matter. And then uh, in 1979, the first measurements of uh, so-called gravitational lensing were made. You can see these really incredible arcs. This is light that's coming perhaps from a distant object that is passing through a massive cluster on its way to us and our measurements. And this is the, the bending of light that was predicted by Albert Einstein. Again, indicating that there is more matter there than you can see. There are a number of ways now that these movements can be made. You can see they're completely independent of each other. For example, here is the uh, cluster of galaxies in which hot X-ray gas, this is a gas that has a temperature of about 100 million degrees, would not remain bound to the cluster again, would have evaporated on timescales, um, much shorter timescales, if there were not more mat matter there. So the evidence has been accumulating for decades. It's now, I think, overwhelming in uh, all of these independent ways lead to the same conclusion. There's about six times more matter in this dark form than there is in luminous form. And it is interacting uh, via gravity. We see the effects of the dark matter on the luminous matter that we can measure. And uh, for... Uh, a couple decades, people were searching for what could be the, the dark matter. And there are many ideas, perhaps they were black holes, perhaps they were stars that were evolved that had uh, uh, evolved to the point that they were very, they, they had exploded already and they were um, uh, very uh, under luminous and hadn't yet been detected. Maybe it was cold gas, maybe it was hot gas, uh, uh, maybe there were planets, failed planets, rocks, but every one, of, and then there were uh, huge numbers of surveys that were carried out to search for what could be the dark matter. And all of them have been ruled out. They, uh, they're just uh, no evidence for these types of, of objects that could be the dark matter. And there are other theoretical reasons too that um, that did not survive. And the best current uh, idea for what the dark matter is, is that there was a, a, a remnant particle that was left over from the Big Bang and it interacts um, only weakly via gravity alone with ordinary matter. And so there are experiments around the world in underground laboratories looking for small acoustic signatures as dark matter might interact with the nucleus of a silicon or a germanium atom. Now xenon and other kinds of uh, detectors are being built um, around the world. Uh, ex uh, accelerator um, uh, are looking for uh, perhaps the remnants of what if in high energy collisions that could signal the presence of a dark matter particle. And uh, then the Fermi gamma ray satellite is looking for potential annihilation. Perhaps there's interactions of dark matter particles that would give rise to gamma rays. And so far, um, the, the, the particle, no dark matter particle has been detected. Despite decades of work and searching, many of the most promising candidates are reaching limits beyond which it won't be possible to, to go further, at least at the current time. So that remains a mystery. We do not know what the nature of dark matter is. Uh, we do know, however, that it, um, is, uh, it controls the, uh, uh, in terms of evolution of structure in the universe. Uh, we do need dark matter to, to explain and to describe the, the growth of structure in the universe. And once again, it is the dominant component 
there is much more dark matter than, than luminous matter in, in the universe. Now the dark energy is completely different and it is, uh, turns out about 70% of the overall composition of the universe is in this form of dark energy. And it is a repulsive form of gravity. It, it's, it is allowed within Einstein's uh, general theory of rel relativity. And, um, and as I said, at, at the time, it was a mathematical convenience, but certainly allowed within, within the theory. Now, the first evidence uh, for the acceleration came with the ability to measure supernovae at very great distances. So a particular kind of supernova, just referred to as a type 1a, and we believe it occurs in a binary system. It could be two white dwarf systems. Uh, these are stars at the end of their stellar evolution, uh, stars with about the mass of the sun, um, and uh, have collapsed to very high density. They're supported by electron uh, degenerate pressure. And another possibility is that there is a companion star and mass from the companion star is being dumped onto the white dwarf when it exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, the star explodes as a white, as a, a, a type 1a supernovae. And, uh, and these are incredibly luminous. They can be seen, in fact, the luminosity rivals that of an entire galaxy and they can be seen uh, to quite large distances. And that's what allows us to measure the Hubble constant at uh, great distances. And so uh, many surveys uh, have been conducted. Uh, you take an image of a galaxy and, um, and then uh, separate it in time when you see an object that is, um, ha hasn't appeared there before, you can subtract off the, the light of the galaxy and get a very accurate measurement of the brightness of the supernova. And uh, those act as a standard candle or a standardizable candle. And uh, much in the same way as with Cepheid variables, we can measure in this case, relative distances. We need the Cepheids and the red giant branch stars to set the absolute scale. And so when the first measurements in the 1990s, the discovery of um, many supernovae, uh, the expectation was that as you looked farther and farther back in, in distance and in time, that the presence of matter in the universe would tend to slow the expansion down. And uh, rather what happened was that uh, the evidence from the supernovae indicated that instead of slowing down because of gravity, they were actually accelerating, uh, the, the universe is undergoing uh, an acceleration. And the first indication, uh, the data, uh, there were small numbers of objects. Uh, it wasn't clear that corrections for dust had been made correctly, but those withstood the test of time. Today, there are literally thousands of supernovae that have been measured. This is, these are distances. Uh, so it's a lot, this is a logarithmic form of distance, so-called distance modulus as a function of the redshift of the galaxy. And this is a fit to the standard Lambda CDM uh, model. And so the evidence for acceleration has only increased with time. And uh, it's now, I think, um, uh, very well established that the universe is undergoing an acceleration. In fact, uh, Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of the acceleration in 2011. Okay, as I mentioned, Einstein's general relativity allows for uh, this repulsive gravity. So it allows for a pressure term as well as density, unlike Newton's uh, theory of gravity. So this is a second equation from Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity. So now we're looking at the second derivative of the scale factor. I showed you earlier the Hubble constant squared the Friedman equation, which is a ratio of the, the first derivative to the scale factor. And uh, here's a cosmological constant. And, and you end up with a repulsive form of gravity look at those two equations where the pressure is less than minus uh, the density uh, divided by three. So it's a, a kind of elastic stuff and uh, it's been termed dark energy and analogy with dark matter. It's a repulsive form of gravity. These are completely different kinds of things. And the simplest example 
is Einstein's cosmological constant. So this ratio of the pressure to energy density, just a quantity that's been um, uh, labeled W here, uh, where the pressure to energy density has a value of minus one. That is Einstein's cosmological constant. And to date, the uh, many, many groups now who've been measuring type 1a supernovae are finding a value of W with minus ones consistent with that. What we don't know yet is whether, for example, the uh, dark energy could evolve with time. And that's something that future generations of facilities, for example, there's a NASA a uh, new mission called W First that is being planned that is uh, one of its top priority goals is to learn whether or not the um, the dark energy might have uh, uh, an evolution with time. And I'm just showing here, this is the uh, behavior uh, in blue of the matter, matter density. So the matter falls off as the universe is expanding. This is, it falls off as uh, uh, the volume gets bigger, uh, as the, the uh, redshift uh, cubed as the volume. And radiation has another component. Uh, it falls off. This is the green here, the radiation. This is showing uh, how this is falling off with redshift or the scale factor. So it's falling off even faster. Radiation dominates earlier in the universe, uh, dominates the matter. And here's the cosmological constant. Constant, um, it, it's constant with time or redshift. And so one of the big outstanding questions is why are we living at a time where essentially now, so this is time now, scale factor one, where the cosmological constant is dominating the dynamics of the universe. It's, a, it's not obvious. And uh, we don't like special circumstances. Uh, we sort of learned the hard way when we look at ourselves at a special place or special time, you know, the earth, the center of the universe, the sun, the center of the universe, all of these things with time, that the amount of matter that there is uh, dominated by a form that we don't uh, experience in our ordinary lives. And here we are uh, now, just now, uh, in, uh, in cosmological sense, where the dark matter dominates. So that's another part of the mystery um, we don't yet understand, don't know the answer to that. But here is the standard model, the Lambda CDM model. It has about 70% in a form of this repulsive dark energy, 25% um, in uh, dark matter, is uh, and the, whose origin is unknown. There's also ordinary dark matter um, and uh, very little in stars, luminous matter, or in neutrinos. So a uh, remarkably successful model in terms of our understanding of the um, growth of structure in the universe. Uh, we have a, a universe that is uh, at the uh, earliest moments undergoes a period of inflation. Um, because of gravitational instability, even known at the time of Newton, a dense region will get denser with time and an underdense region will get less dense with time. Um, when we look at measurements of, this is the background radiation from the Big Bang, and the different colors here represent different temperatures of the Big Bang radiation, which has now been measured to remarkable precision. We're talking about levels of tens of microkelvin. Um, if we allow for inflation, this gravitational instability plus cool dark matter, as we've been talking about, then you end up with uh, the growth of structure in the universe, uh, starting from these initial conditions, uh, small quantum fluctuations in the early universe. Uh, and you can see the differences in density represented by these temperature fluctuations. You allow them to grow in an expanding universe and you end up with chains and filaments and voids and very much related to the structure that we see when we go out and observe. This is a, a early map of the universe, the nearby universe, and you look at uh, measure velocities, which give you the third dimension. So not only angular position on the sky, but also a distance, according to Hubble's law. And, uh, and there are these large voids and, and filaments that, uh, that this cold dark matter model explains extremely well with a cosmological constant. This image here is of the Hubble Deep Field, which is observed by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's where we are. We have this remarkably successful theory, and I'll show in a moment the um, new observations of the cosmic microwave background. 
but we need to ask the question of whether something could be missing in our current understanding of the early universe. So the, the model fits a, a wide range of data, explains a number of uh, issues. For example, at the time of the key project, uh, one of the issues uh, in the factor of two debate uh, if you had too high a value of the, of the Hubble constant, too high an expansion rate, you would end up with a universe that was younger than its oldest stars. And the resolution to that problem turned out to be the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. And um, what we're seeing now, so here is in just a pictorial form of, of the, the current issue. When measurements of the microwave background uh, are made, and you fit the uh, power spectrum, I'll show that in a moment, uh, to the, the uh, Lambda CDM model, it provides an exquisite fit. And you can then infer what the value of the Hubble constant is based on these fluctuation measurements. And you get a value of something like 67 and a half, roughly. If you make the measurements now using Cepheids, and the most recent measurements uh, using Cepheids, give a value of the Hubble constant about 74. And there are some people uh, in their analysis who have determined that th it's a, a more than a five sigma tension between these two values. So everything depends on how well these uh, two different measurements have been made. Uh, and so one possibility is there's an error in one or in both of the measurements. But the more is interesting possibility is that both are correct and that, uh, that there is something that is missing from the model, which you're fitting to determine the uh, value of the Hubble constant based on the, the Big Bang uh, temperature measurements and, uh, and, 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 and you need additional physics. So that, that's what we're trying to explore right now. Is this tension real? Uh, does it show that there's something beyond the standard model? And we have to remember, of course, there are many elements of the standard model that we don't understand, despite the fact that it fits the data extremely well. But the Hubble constant is really the only uh, apparently very large discrepancy that um, has surfaced. So how do we explain that? So here is a, a map from the uh, the Planck satellite. This is a measurement of the background temperature uh, from the Big Bang. Uh, so you're measuring the temperature in different parts of the sky and you can compute the angular power spectrum of those fluctuations uh, shown here. And uh, these, this is large scale, so there aren't as many points uh, large scale. We have only one universe to make measurements uh, at very large scales. And uh, to the right is smaller scales. And the angular scale is shown here. So the, the first peak that is shown here, you can see is, is at a, an angular scale of about one degree. And the fit here, which you can see at large scales and then emerges again at small scales, but fits so well, you can't see it in these uh, uh, fluctuations here. Uh, that is the Lambda CDM model, our standard uh, cosmological model. So uh, it's an exquisite fit for which you need dark matter, you need dark energy. And if you apply this um, to these measurements, which I said again, so th these are now measurements uh, at uh, 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 tens of micron, uh, micro Kelvin, it's an exquisite measurement. Now this was predicted in the 1970s, uh, but no one thought that anyone would have the, the the technical ability to make the measurements. So it's quite extraordinary, the progress that has been made uh, recently. And, uh, and it, it's hard not to look at this plot. I think it's one of the most beautiful experiments that's been done in recent years in our field. It, it's a spectacular achievement. But the question is, uh, it, it, so you can fit these peaks with different uh, values of uh, dark matter, dark energy, the Hubble constant, and still get a good fit. There are some degeneracies. And so that's why making measurements of the Hubble constant locally to really high accuracy constrains this um, and, and is a test of the cosmological model. So what's happening is uh, early in the universe, you've got radiation from the Big Bang, you have gravity, which is an attractive force, and you set up oscillations, essentially they're like sound waves. And what you're seeing, these are the, the modes of the, uh, the ringing um, in, in, in the early universe, acoustic oscillations. 
So having made those measurements, we now go back to the Hubble Space Telescope where we can make measurements of the Hubble constant locally and test whether or not uh, there's actually a difference from what we measure at uh, the so-called surface of last scattering where we see the, the radiation from the Big Bang. So here I'm showing the values of the Hubble constant as a function of uh, year of publication, beginning with our measurement from the Hubble Key Project. So we measured a value of 70 two with an uncertainty of 10%. And the other measurements here, so th this one, the Carnegie Hubble Pro program, when I was at uh, Carnegie before I moved to the University of Chicago, this is what we used to make, we made measurements uh, with the, the Spitzer Space Telescope at 3.6 microns and recalibrated the, the Hubble Key Project data. And this is uh, the other points here been made by the SHOES team you can see that they, the value of the Hubble constant has remained remarkably constant over time. And what has changed is the, uh, the error bars. They have come down quite considerably in the intervening time. Now, if we look at the measurements from the microwave background, these are early observations that were made by the WMAP satellite, the Milken, uh, Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe. Um, uh, th they've come down with time slightly, but uh, also the error bars have come down considerably. These are measurements made uh, with the Planck satellite, uh, European satellite. And if we uh, look now, this is a measurement made using gravitational waves. These are measurements of neutron star, neutron star binaries, and first detections with the LIGO um, experiment which I think in future uh, is going to be a fantastic technique. It's completely independent of the microwave background, completely independent of Cepheids or Tepler Giant Branch or Supernovae, and we need as many independent measurements as we can make. The error bars now, they only have one object that's been discovered so far. So the error bars are very large. It's kind of amusing. It just happened to fall right at 70. Um, so at the moment, it's not helpful in distinguishing uh, amongst the different um, experiments, but ultimately will be. But you can see that the measurements from the, the Cepheids uh, are uh, discrepant. The error bars are not overlapping. And depending on who you do, how you do the error analysis, uh, the, the discrepancy is four to five sigma, which is indicating that there may be something about the universe that we don't yet understand, uh, something beyond the standard model. So if it's real, and uh, they're, uh, the, both measurements are correct, what could it be? And uh, one possibility is that there is a, a, another relativistic species. And so people have given a lot of attention to perhaps an additional neutrino or what people are referring to as dark radiation. And interestingly, it's a, it's a great idea in principle, but those peaks that I showed you, the acoustic spectrum for the Planck data are so well determined that you can't add another neutrino without moving the positions of those peaks. So you have very little room to move now. It's, uh, that does not appear to be a, a viable option. You could have a different equation of state for dark energy. I showed you that the current measurements seem to be consistent with W equals minus one, but the constraints, how it changes as a function of redshift, there aren't very strong constraints now, but it also appears to be very uh, difficult to do this, to, to change things as a function of redshift, again, without changing uh, and be, being in conflict with other measurements, for example, the matter density fluctuations in the universe. So that also uh, it doesn't appear as promising as it did a few years ago. People have discussed other kinds of dark matter particles that perhaps decay. You could modify gravity, uh, perhaps a modification to general relativity. You could have spatial curvature that isn't zero, although uh, the Planck uh, data now suggest pretty high accuracy that it is very close to zero. Um, people are looking now into early universe physics prior to this epoch of recombination where photons from the background are able to free stream to us after the universe has cooled enough to form hydrogen and the electrons are not scattering the photons from the Big Bang. So that's a very active area, uh, area of investigation, but it turns out to be very difficult to do and the models at the moment are not motivated by any physics that's well understood and they appear to be very contrived. So, um, and, and then there are other possibilities people have considered. So 
This doesn't mean that uh, there isn't some way that the universe hasn't figured out how to do this, but we haven't uh, yet found a way to explain uh, this difference in the Hubble constant. You can try and do that, but it, it then causes problems with the other parameters that are being measured and with these very well measured peaks. So it, that remains a mystery at the moment. So this is what uh, motivated uh, me and, uh, and our group to use a different kind of star than a Cepheid variable to try and measure from the ground up a new calibration of the Hubble constant. And what we've chosen to use are a certain kind of star. Uh, these are stars that have masses uh, comparable to our own sun. They've evolved to the point where they've exhausted the uh, hydrogen in their cores. They've fused their hydrogen into helium. And, uh, and at that point, the star begins to collapse and they end up with a degenerate uh, core and a helium core. So at that point, the core is made of helium and they have a shell where uh, now the hydrogen is being fused into helium in this shell. That's what powers the luminosity of these stars. And because they have a degenerate core, they can't, uh, as the temperature is increasing, um, the pressure is not increasing and the star is not expanding and cooling. So the temperature keeps rising until eventually it reaches about 100 million degrees, at which point you get a thermonuclear runaway and you're able to undergo the so-called triple alpha uh, process. So you're actually uh, able to have enough phase space at that point where you can settle and begin to burn helium in the core, uh, a non-degenerate core. And the uh, the, the, what happens as a result is this, the star climbs in luminosity this, along the so-called red giant branch. I'll show you that in a moment. And then it reaches this luminosity where it undergoes the, the so-called core helium flash and starts to burn helium. And then the star disappears from, uh, it, 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 it becomes much fainter and you don't see it. And that is if you look at the halo of a galaxy where you have thousands of these red giant stars, they never exceed this luminosity, which is set by very fundamental physics. It makes it an exquisitely good standard candle and uh, therefore very useful for measuring distances to galaxies. So we set out uh, with a program to measure the halos of nearby galaxies. Uh, we might recall that for the Cepheids, we have a problem that we are confined to the disks of the galaxies because the Cepheids are young. They're found in regions of gas and dust, which we have to correct for. And, and so you're stuck there. And the density of stars is higher in the uh, higher luminosity surface brightness parts of galaxies. So the, the measurement of the luminosity is also harder. So the red giant branch stars have the advantage that we can go out into the halo measure hundreds of these stars, their luminosities, and have a standard candle to measure the distances. So that's what we've done the last few years using the advanced camera for surveys on the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, so here we are out in the halo of a galaxy. This one's at about 11 megaparsecs away. And here just circled so you can actually see them by eye. So you uh, can see that you can make a very accurate measurement of the luminosity. These stars don't have much in the way of neighbors. And so we can measure these uh, stars extremely accurately. Okay, so uh, we have a program with, with Hubble. Uh, the next thing we need is a sample of supernovae. And this is a project that Mark Phillips and I uh, led at, when I was at Carnegie using a range of telescopes from one meter, two and a half meters to our Magellan 6.5 meter. So the farther away the, the uh, supernovae were and the fainter uh, as they faded with time, we would use the larger telescopes to monitor them very carefully. And so uh, these are the so-called light curves of supernovae. You find these stars as they're just beginning to explode, and then they decrease in brightness with times, not unlike Cepheids in that way, but they don't repeat. Uh, so you have to catch them. And we observe them uh, with nine different filters. We wanted to make sure that we could correct for 
the presence of interstellar dust and differences in composition of the supernovae. So we put a lot of effort into getting a self-consistent data set to allow us to deal with these types of systematics that I've been describing. We also got spectra as a function of time. So it's, it's a, a, a beautiful uh, homogeneous sample of supernovae. And now we can apply our calibration. This particular diagram shows uh, both Cepheids and red giants. So this is the Hubble diagram distance as a function of velocity. And uh, the blue points here are the distant supernovae in the sample. And the red points are the, the nearby objects. And you can see that the scatter increases as you come to uh, closer distances. And the reason for that is the velocity perturbations that I described earlier because of the gravitational interaction of galaxies. And so, uh, but we don't use the velocities, we only use the distances for the calibrating sample. So these are the stars that determine the absolute luminosities of the supernovae from which we can then determine the Hubble constant. So what do we find? I think what we expected to find was that we would either confirm the Cepheids or we would confirm the cosmic microwave background measurements. And we landed right in the middle and uh, we determined a value of uh, 69.6. And uh, it's consistent essentially with both. Uh, it's closer, of course, to the cosmic microwave background observations. And if we hadn't had the Cepheids, we would say, well, there's absolutely no problem at all. And uh, perhaps we don't need any new physics, but we don't at this point, understand the reason for the differences between the tip of the red giant branch and the Cepheids. And there are many possibilities. Um, and uh, as someone who spent uh, decades studying Cepheids, and one of the reasons why I wanted to start studying the red giant branch stars is that these kinds of issues like reddening by dust, the fact that you find them in the disks where the, it's hard to make a measurement against the background light of the galaxy, and we also have to worry about abundance effects. So we're putting a lot of effort now into trying to make very detailed observations to understand, again, is this a real difference or are there systematics that we might not have understood to this point? And so here's a comparison of the um, Cepheid distances compared to the tip of the red giant branch. Uh, so here, for nearby distances. These have been measured largely with ground-based telescopes. And the black points have no supernovae. Uh, no, they're not hosting uh, type 1a supernovae in these galaxies. And these are the measurements that are uh, galaxies that do have Cepheids, tip of the red giant branch, and supernovae. So the scatter goes up as we go to larger distances, that's not surprising. It's harder to make these measurements. It's harder for both methods. Um, but there's also a shift in the zero point. And we have to worry about that shift in the zero point because that is what determines the Hubble constant. And we don't yet understand the origin of that. So in the last year, we've been making measurements. I measured, mentioned this galaxy, NGC 4258, that hosts a maser um, uh, th this is, has a supermassive black hole in its center and has these uh, water mega masers that are orbiting the, the black hole. And uh, again, we targeted the outer halo region of the galaxy. We want to avoid the disk. So here's where the Cepheids are located in, in this galaxy. But we want to be confined here where there's no dust and the, the crowding overlapping of images um, from the galaxy itself is minimal. So we've just done that. And what we find is that when we measure the brightnesses of the stars in the halo, they uh, agree, in fact, to 1% with what we uh, originally measured in the, in the measurement that I showed you that led to the 69.6. So a confirmation of the zero point that we used, um, which is reassuring. And, um, and then in the last... Um, several months, we've just uh, finished up a study of stars in our own galaxy that are located in clusters. These are known as globular clusters. They um, have hundreds of stars per cluster. Um, and there's a sample of stars that have been measured with this Gaia uh, astrometric satellite that I mentioned, so we can determine the membership uh, of these stars extremely well. We know they're members of the clusters. 
And uh, we can look, uh, I mentioned, uh, we're measuring stars that have luminosities that um, they reach their peak luminosity before they begin their core helium, stable core helium burning here on the so-called horizontal branch. And so um, we, we've been able to make a measurement of uh, the stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And we are again finding extremely good agreement with the uh, zero point of our calibration from last year. So uh, we're beginning to become much more confident in the measurements from the tip of the red giant branch, at least in terms of the calibration. And so what we're actively working on now is comparing measurements of the tip of the red giant branch in galaxies that also have Cepheids measured and supernovae to try and get to the bottom of this discrepancy at larger distances where we see the larger scatter and the, the bigger offset. And so current time, I can't tell you where this will end up, uh, but I'm encouraged by this really phenomenal agreement in very different measurements, these Maser galaxies, parallax measurements are, uh, in, uh, in, in our own Milky Way galaxy that I should mention will improve enormously in the um, coming months as Gaia publishes a new catalog. Um, we actually used a different geometric distance indicator here. We're going to wait for the new uh, Gaia calibration. But uh, at, at the present time, the agreement is, is uh, spectacularly good. So I'm showing now just a comparison. These are probability density um, functions for the different types of measurements. These are the Planck results, the uh, cosmic microwave background. Um, there are also measurements of the matter density shown here in orange. And so those are giving these low values of the Hubble constant uh, around uh, 67 or 68 or so. There was a, a measurement using lensing, uh, strong gravitational lensing. Uh, again, a method that's completely independent of Cepheids or supernovae or tip of the red giant branch. It was uh, early on giving a high value of the Hubble constant. They've actually reanalyzed it and uh, they're finding a lower value. But what's interesting is that the uncertainty has gone way up because they recognize that the assumptions they were making and the modeling of these lenses, uh, and I uh, briefly mentioned uh, gravitational lensing in the context of dark matter, um, which makes this measurement much less secure uh, because they have to make this assumption of, of the underlying uh, matter dis distribution in the cluster. So here's where the Cepheids lie at 74 and um, the gravitational wave sirens that I mentioned, the, the one object so far, uh, so that's not giving much of uh, an indication of, of where this is going to resolve. And here's the tip of the red giant branch. So the tip of the red giant branch now has 18 uh, host uh, 1As, Cepheids have 19, so it's quite a comparable sample. And, um, and this is where we, we're at. This is the uh, uncertainty that we're facing. And what I find, I think, uh, exciting at the present time is that the opportunity to resolve this issue is, is, is before us. As I mentioned, the Gaia satellite is about to come out with a, a new release of their data where they will have these parallaxes for Cepheids and tip of the red giant branch that will be at the sub percent level. And so the, in terms of the absolute zero point of both of those scales, that will no longer uh, be in any question. The uh, Hubble Space Telescope we are still using to measure nearby galaxies that have type 1a supernovae. So our sample of galaxies with which to make these measurements is, is continuing to increase and supernovae are, are occurring. Uh, and as they occur, we, we follow them up. And a year from now, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched and uh, that will have um, infrared capability, which is particularly useful for these red giant branch stars. Now Hubble has been really useful for Cepheids because the bulk of the radiation for a Cepheid is emitted in the op optical part of the spectrum. And uh, the uh, red giant branch stars, uh, it's the infrared part that, uh, that is, uh, will allow us to make these measurements out to greater distances and, and greater volumes, allowing us to make more measurements of supernovae. So uh, this, and I'm not even mentioning the ground-based telescopes, for example, the giant Magellan telescope, this was the telescope that I, I led uh, for 
12 years, uh, which will be a 25 meter telescope located in the Andes Mountains in Chile and uh, great resolving power. It's going to be superb for measuring red giant branch stars and another NASA satellite by the name of WFIRST, which is being built to, uh, in fact, let us determine whether the dark energy is evolving with time also will be a tremendous um, uh, facility to allow us to um, measure red giant branch stars. So I I think uh, very shortly within the next few years, we will have resolved this current tension one way or another. We're either going to learn that there is a new physics that is is, um, missing from our standard model Uh, or we will confirm that standard model. And I think we're at the point where we're now measuring distances at a level of a few percent, which I think is a spectacular uh, improvement compared to where we were only a couple of decades ago. I think perhaps we're impatient to resolve this tension, uh, but it it is difficult as you've seen, these are astrophysical objects and, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan once told us. But I think uh, the extraordinary evidence is becoming available and we will soon have an answer to this question. So I will stop here now and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. So thank you so much for this, uh, bringing us up to date on, on what's going on with this. I guess my big question for you would be to start things off. uh, Do you think there's new physics or do you think these measurements will ultimately reconcile? I don't know the answer to that question. You know, of course, I hope there's new physics because I think that would be fun. And, uh, but I, I, I think we have to measure it. That's why I don't know the answer. And, and I have spent a lot of time in my career worried about systematic effects. I just tend to be, um, uh, I like to be able to make measurements where you can demonstrate that you have uh, avoided or minimized or um, reduced the systematic errors. And I am not yet convinced that they have been reduced to the point that we can claim new physics. That said, if you, look at the last plot that I showed that showed the different values of the Hubble constant, they are on one side. We're not seeing a lot of values that are coming in at 60 or 64, um, but there are some, it's, it's not zero. They just don't have as many objects in them, which is why I didn't put them on, on that particular plot. But I, I think, um, I don't know the answer to that, I, 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 I'll, but I want to measure it. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Well, with that, let me, let me uh, turn it over to the other participants. So uh, Zoom participants, uh, you can ask your questions by raising your Zoom hand, and we will call on you and unmute you in turn so you can ask your question. Zoom participants, you can also submit questions in the Zoom Q&A panel. And all of the people who are viewing on YouTube can enter questions in text in the YouTube chat box, and we will read all text questions aloud so everybody can hear them. So let's start off with with Carl Merrill, a member. Uh, Carl, you are on. Hi. um, One thing, in one of your slides, you mentioned non-Gaussian primordial fluctuations. I, I wonder if you could expand and and tell us what your what that actually is the other thing that i I thought about um and i just wanted to mention it is that uh, they've been discovering very high energy particles of both uh, as cosmic rays coming in um recently in argentina in particular and then uh, at the at the south pole uh curiously coming through the earth apparently um but but those particles um, made me begin to think one of Stephen Hawking's ideas were these small primor- primordial black holes that might even be the size of a Planck particle. Um, and so they would be a fraction, a fraction is even, isn't even the word, many orders of magnitude smaller than an atomic nucleus. So they'd probably have a very small collisional cross section, um, but they might have effects like that. And one of the things people use to rule them out is the fact that they'd irradiate or evaporate very quickly. But if, in fact, they were traveling close to the speed of light like neutrinos do, then they'd be in a different time frame. And so then they could last um, 
into our epoch, if you want to think of it that way, but they don't, they could also be a decaying mass of dark particle that you mentioned there. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. So I just make a couple of uh, comments. So the, the non-Gaussian fluctuations to the, to the extent that it's been possible to look at the, the fluctuations of uh, in temperature and polarization now, they appear to be Gaussian. And that's in fact, one of the predictions of inflation um, that at least they'd be, uh, and so it's consistent with that. But now as the measurements have gotten more and more precise, it's it will in future get more precise than looking for the effects of non-Gaussian to become important. And so uh, it will be possible to put constraints on that. It, it's not something that right now, I think most people would say that's how this problem is going to be resolved. Um, but it's something that with better data, you know, there'll be better constraints on, on non-Gaussianity. With respect to the cosmic rays, the, um, I mean, those are very interesting measurements, but the, the high energy cosmic rays are probably coming to us from um, objects that we know about, uh, supernova explosions and, and um, you know, black holes and, and other uh, highly energetic events that, uh, that, these, that they're uh, traveling to us, but not related to, to this particular question. But in, in terms of dark matter and, and decaying dark matter, I think, again, we don't know what it is. And um, these are questions that people are looking at in some detail. The, the issue of black holes, you're right, the, the um, very small ones evaporate very quickly, but people reopen the idea of, you know, even gram mass up to, I don't know, uh, you know, orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude greater than that, and looked for possibilities um, could they contribute to dark matter and so on? So the, the limits have gotten better and better with time. We, we uh, you were you know, eliminating a lot of parameter space, but parameter space, especially for dark matter, is very large. I mean, looking at tiny little <laughs> masses up to very large mass scales and uh, people held out hope for a long time that supersymmetric um, particles, a stable supersymmetric particle would be the dark matter, but we're now reaching the floor where neutrino, solar neutrinos are going to set a systematic floor. Um, but people are looking. You know, axions, it, it, a lot of possibilities, uh, but so far no detections, which is frustrating. There's a lot of effort has gone into this and it sure would be nice, but you know, there still remains the possibility that it'll never be detected, that maybe it only interacts by gravity and um, we'll have no way of, of ascertaining what it is. We, we don't know. I have a question from Jennifer Weissman. Jennifer, can you ask your question? Hi, Wendy, this is just a fabulous talk. And, and so um, the question I have is so simple, it's embarrassing. Um, but I've always wondered, there's so much attention being paid to the distance measurements and the distance ladder and the distance scale as you so eloquently described. But we also, to, to understand um, the Hubble constant, need to know the velocities of these galaxies, right? Or, or the redshifts, I should say. So are those measurements also getting more precise and do they need to be? Yeah, it, you know, it's a good question. And, and, and the reason we don't talk about them very much is there's so much more easy to measure than the distances. So the, the redshifts come from measuring the displacement of spectral lines. Um, so we know what uh, the, the measurement in, in the laboratory on Earth is, where a given spectral lie, line should, should be, and then we measure its displacement in the galaxy or uh, object in question. And that you can make very precisely. And so uh, in comparison to the uncertainties in the distances where you think of these large distances over where, you know, which we're measuring, and the astrophysical effects, the presence of dust, the chemical composition of the stars in question, the, the difficulty of making accurate measurements in crowded regions, those just overwhelm the, the uncertainties and the velocity. So that's why you don't hear about them. They're, they can be very accurately measured. Okay, you thank you. I see Lenoise in your spectra. You, you, it's just a measurement of a displacement of a line. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I have a question from uh, PSW member Joel Wilson. Joel, hi. Hi. 
Hi, uh, thank you, Professor. It's great, uh, great talk. Uh, two kind of questions. It's wondering, aren't we forced to look for new physics because the standard model is really incomplete because gravity is the odd man out still? And the second question is, is there any thought about how the Higgs field or the Higgs boson would interact to generate dark matter? Yeah, so your question about aren't we obligated to look for something missing in the standard model? I think, yes. I mean, I think we're always testing our models. And, and I think um, it, the fact that we don't understand what the dark matter is, the fact we don't understand what dark energy is, these are big missing pieces to our understanding of cosmology. And it, it, at some level, it, it's, it's really surprising how well this model fits so much of the data that we have. So something appears to be correct, but whether in future there'll be some conceptual change in our understanding, I think it's too early to say. I think the fact that we really have so many questions, you know, why is the, the level of dark energy so small compared to what you would uh, compute uh, from our best particle physics models? Why now is the expansion being dominated by the cosmological constant? It's, um, yeah, behooves yeah. us to test the standard model and it wouldn't be surprising if there's something beyond it. And that's why, you know, I, I find this such mm -hmm. an intriguing question because, you know, almost certainly there will be. Is it, 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 is the evidence from the difference in the Hubble constant what ultimately will show that there's a crack in the standard model? I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but, but we'll see. And yeah, people are thinking reactively about what the dark matter would be and how it fits into the Higgs sector. And, uh... mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we have a question from uh, a YouTube viewer. Uh, <clears throat> Does the spectral exclusion of additional neutrinos exclude a heavy right-handed electron neutrino or does it exclude a left-handed neutrino from a fourth family above tau? So I think one of the interesting possibilities people have been thinking about a lot in, um, in uh, recently is a so-called sterile neutrino. And it's interesting that a lot of the constraints on the uh, uh, participation of neutrinos in the overall cosmic budget have come from uh, astronomical observations. And one of the things that will happen with uh, new generations of, of telescopes that are being planned, there's a CMB S4, it's a, a big national effort to make more accurate measurements. There's another observatory called the Simons Observatory. And, uh, and those will allow um, constraints on the mass, the sum of the masses of neutrinos. Uh, uh, and again, these are uh, issues that will have an impact on the peak, the measurement of the peaks. And so um, those are going to get uh, to a point where they really do constrain neutrino physics. So I think there's a lot yet to come. And in the next decade, that's going to be a really, it's, that's one of the uh, main motivations for these new facilities is to try and, and, and get more accurate constraints on, on neutrino physics. I have another question from the lab. This one's a little more on the speculative side, I think. So the, uh, the viewer asks, what do you think of an antiverse? Could the Big Bang have been two-sided? Any thoughts on that? And by refringence, a preferred direction. So an antiverse, so I tell you as an observer, I can't observe it. <laughs> and I think, um, so you know, I, I confine myself to things that I, I can really make a measurement of. And I think you know, those kinds of things, they're fun to think about. Um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of antiverse, but the antimatter, uh, if it, if it um, encounters matter, of course, there's annihilation and we see the signal for that. So there are constraints on the types of universes that there could be. And um, uh, what, I, what I find fascinating is that we can make so many measurements now that are telling us about the nature of the universe and, and, uh, and the uh, constraints on other types of things that people might have speculated about really narrowing down and yet we find ourselves with these mysteries like dark matter and dark energy and we're talking about 95 percent of the universe so so we've got mysteries that <laughs> really do need to be solved and uh and we're not there yet 
So another kind of speculative question to maybe put you on the spot a little bit. Which possibilities for new physics will be the most difficult to observe? <laughs> so, you know, I, I think um, would be the most difficult to observe new physics. Well, there would be things, so uh, if we look back a couple of decades ago, we didn't have measurements of the microwave background to the level of detail that we now do in the angular power spectrum. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned is that there is a, a degeneracy amongst the various cosmological parameters. So it's the, the values that you get for a particular uh, parameter um, are not unique in the sense that if, if we learned, for example, that the dark matter density was different than now seems to be coming out of those measurements along with other measurements, it would change things slightly, but you would still have um, a good fit. Um, so right now, the early uh, dark energy that I talked about, people are trying to think about ways where you could have something that is like a cosmological constant, but it has to fade away right at the time that of recombination. And so it's a, you have to postulate that it's there and then it suddenly turns off suddenly when you can make other measurements that show that it can't be there. And so you could imagine hiding all sorts of things that you can't measure, you know, come up with some theory that something that could happen that could be hidden from us. Um, but then you can't do anything about it if you can't measure it. So I'm sure the universe has thought of, of ways of doing things that at the moment we have no way of uh, measuring. But, you know, what, what's remarkable to me is if you look back a century ago, and here was Einstein uh, thinking about gravitational waves, but never imagining that we would have the kind of technical capability to measure things at the level of quantum noise and you know, detectors uh, like LIGO can now do. It's just, it's phenomenal what these kinds of measurements now are. The, and the measurement of gravitational waves predicted by Einstein, you look at the acoustic oscillation spectrum, and again, that was predicted theoretically, but there was no, and no one imagined that it was going to be possible to make measurements like that. So there will be new kinds of measurements. And, and, and as you push the technology or where these real new discoveries have come have been uh, as the technology improves. So we, we will continue to have surprises. We, we, you know, we thought we knew what the universe was made out of. It was ordinary baryons. And now suddenly uh, it, our picture has changed dramatically. Uh, and the dominant constituent in the universe appears to be in this dark energy form. So uh, we have a lot to learn. So if there is dark energy, and it is a repulsive gravitational force, then would you tend to think that you can make an anti-gravity machine? Yeah, well, good luck. Again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the scale of Earth. So, so the reason that the effect of um, uh, the dark energy is so great is the volume of the universe is so large, right? But the, the density of this stuff is 10 to the minus 30 grams per cc. So if you could figure out a way how to harness that, boy, you would do well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, that's an example now. We have no clue how to do it a century from now. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you, you, you'd do very well if you could figure that out. <laughs> well, the fact that it, there is a possibility that there's anti-gravitational effect suggests that there's some route technologically to use it, perhaps someday, however weak it may be. Um, <clears throat> we have another question of the three units. Each fundamental constant is expressed in which are you certain physics understands 100%? <laughs> 100%? <laughs> Well, you know, I think Newton's uh, um, constant of gravity, I think we've measured pretty well. I think there are limits on the fine structure constant, uh, some of which come from astronomy. I, I think, you know, these limits keep improving with time and uh, um, you know, measurements of speed of light and so on. So I, I think um, most of the physical constants have been well measured, but there, you know, I, I think as we probe, so for example, uh, very small scales or very large scales, it, 
I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the scale of the solar system, Newton's gravity works really well, but it breaks down, for example, at the orbit of a Mercury and general relativity is needed to explain the advance of the perihelion of, of Mercury. And when you get into a really strong gravitational field like a black hole, it, where does general relativity perhaps break down? So I think you're getting to scales where starting to probe where um, additional physics might be needed, but anything that you do has to already explain what, you know, Newton's laws work on the scale of the solar system. Um, Einstein's gravity works better uh, and for strong gravity, um, but we don't yet understand, you know, Einstein spent, as we know, a lot of time trying to unify the forces of nature and he didn't know about all of them, but there is no theory for, um, having gravity and, and uh, uh, quantum physics, um, we, we don't yet know how to merge those two. And it, that's where cosmo you know, it's important in cosmology because early in the universe, you had, again, really high d densities, really high temperatures, and you were, uh, you had to deal with quantum gravity. And so, um, you know, there are parts of the theory that are uh, yet to be understood and um, we don't know where that will go. I have another question uh, from the web. Uh, Steve Iden asks, the cosmological constant appears as a first order correction proportional to the metric. Are the CMBR data consistent with higher order corrections with additional cosmological constants? So the, the CMD, CMB data are consistent with a lambda CDM model, which is the basis of which is uh, general relativity. So there's no indication at this point that you need anything other than GR. Now, one of the interesting things, you know, the equation uh, that I showed early on, um, the you know the geometry term and the energy and matter term, um, one you know measures the constituents of the universe, the energy and the matter um, in, the, in the universe, and the other is the, the geometry. And so um, there's, you can study the growth of structure in the universe, which people are now doing. And if general relativity is correct, then what you predict from Einstein's equations for the growth of structure will match what you determine based on uh, um, measuring the components of the matter and energy. And so, you know, these kinds of things are being tested and, and the measurements are getting better and better and we'll see. But so far, um, there is no indication that uh, general relativity is not a good uh, theory that describes um, the, the curvature nature of the universe and geometry and its energy content. But again, you probe it in regions that haven't been probed yet, uh, you know, very high, um, uh, strong gravity fields, uh, we will learn more. I think that is a good place to close out the Q&A session. And I think we can all thank Wendy for giving a really great and interesting talk and bringing us up to date on, on this uh, potential crisis, but maybe not in cosmology. Um, we really appreciate your taking the time to uh, speak with us. And I uh, thank everybody for joining us as well. The recording of tonight's lecture will be available to everybody on the PSW Science YouTube channel. And in due course, we'll post it to Vimeo and uh, it will be available via the PSW Science website. Please share the links with your friends and subscribe to the channel for notifications on new postings. And you can, before you go, we have a few important announcements. The next lecture, the 2,429th meeting, will be in two weeks on Friday, November 20th, 2020. The speaker will be Rob Bertram, and his lecture will be on golden rice. The rest of the fall lecture series has been posted to the website. Check there often for updates. Please note one change to the schedule. The lecture on the triple mission to Europa being planned in Germany will be given by Christoph Waldman instead of Oliver Funk. Before we go, let's thank tonight's crew, James, 
Anne and Robert for doing all the hard work of bringing this Zoom and YouTube live stream to you. And with that, I will now adjourn the 2,428th meeting of the society to the social hour. I wish everyone a good evening. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>